Welcome to Unit 11, Geopolitical Risks and Democracy Transition. Our agenda for Unit 11 is as follows. Grey Zone, Feckless Pluralism, Dominant Power Politics, J-Curve, The Arab Spring and Pamizi G. First to Grey Zone. Thomas Carruthers states that most of the transitional countries are either dictatorial nor clearly headed towards democracy. They enter a political grey zone where they have some attributes of democratic political life, including at least limited political space for opposition parties and regular elections. However, they suffer from serious democratic deficits, often including poor representation of citizens' interests, low levels of political participation beyond voting, frequent abuse of the law by government officials, elections of uncertain legitimacy, persistency poor institutional performance by the state. Therefore, political analysts use terms to describe these as qualified democracies, terms to characterise them including semi-democracy, formal democracy, electoral democracy, Facade democracy, pseudo democracy, weak democracy, partial democracy, illiberal democracy, and virtual democracy. Here we have two main symptoms feckless pluralism and dominant power politics. Feckless pluralism is characterized as follows political freedom, regular elections, and alternation of power, but democracy remains shallow and troubled. Political participation, though broad at election time, extends little beyond voting. Political elites from all the major parties or groupings are widely perceived as corrupt, self-interested and ineffective. Social and political reforms are similarly tenuous and successive governments are unable to make headway on most of the major problems. Short-lived parties led by charismatic individuals or temporary alliances in search of political identity. A good example is Ukraine, where the country in early 2014 was plunged into a political crisis, with demonstrations in response to the future direction of the nation, the government imprisoning opposition leaders, and accusations of election fraud. Dominant power politics, for example, has some political contestation by opposition groups, and at least most of the basic institutional forms of democracy. A political party, family or single leader dominates the system in such a way that there appears to be little prospect of alternation of power in the foreseeable future. We may see that long held on power by one political group usually produces large scale corruption and crony capitalism. Dominant power systems are tend to be found in Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Now we turn to Ian Bremer's J-curve. Bremer created the J-curve to help explain how stability and openness may be impacted as the country progresses towards democracy, or even regresses. Openness includes external conditions, the extent a nation is in harmony with the cross currents of globalisation, and whether they can, for example, access international media, books, call abroad, embark on international travel. Internal includes the flow of information ideas within a country and whether they, the public, are free to communicate with each other. And whether there is freedom of speech, transparency of local and national government. The stability axis concerns the state's capacity to withstand shocks. For example, disputed elections like the US versus Taiwan in 2003 and Ukraine in 2004 and 2010. States with moderate stability tend to have economic and political structures that function effectively. For low stability, you may find institutions are still able to function, but they struggle to effectively implement policies. No stability is a failed state. Somalia, where they can either implement or enforce government policy, typically countries whose stability is in question are more susceptible to sudden crises. You can argue that India's J-curve is higher than Pakistan, as better able to withstand shocks. For the shape of the J-curve, Bremer argues that the left side is steeper at consolidation and control can prove provide a lot of stability. 
It is also faster and easier to close than an open country. As the country moves towards openness initially, they may encounter greater instability, as restrictions on say movement, political expression and communism are eased or lifted. But after a period where the institutions have taken root, stability increases. Bremer also suggested that the J-curve can move up and down. For example, when an actual disaster hits, the curve may slip lower, and for greater openness it shifts higher. For example, the 2010 Haiti earthquake had a decimating impact, clearly illustrating the country's lack of resilience to withstand and recover from major earthquakes, pushing its curve down. Some countries are more vulnerable than others, e.g. having a smaller economy can make them more vulnerable to economic shocks and greater dependence on international oil. The Arab Spring is a good example of how the J-curve can be applied. Tunisia, Egypt and Libya have each struggled in their own way. Tunisia has held elections and maintains a democratically elected government, while political assassinations, for example, have created some challenges. But it is in a better position than Egypt, for example, where in 2013 the elected government of Morsi was overthrown in a military coup. So far, the country has struggled to find a peaceful and sustainable path towards democracy. But should democracy always be the end goal? Alternative political structures and processes may still provide the rights and economic growth that citizens are content with, leaving their country to be managed in their citizens' eyes in an effective way. Saudi Arabia, for example, illustrates this, although its considerable oil wealth does certainly help. Finally, I want to say a few words about the George Friedman piece. This is in many eyes an ambitious book. What it does though is get you to think about how political, military, economic, social, infrastructure, information on geophysical, called Pamita G for short, and its attributes may impact national and international developments. See how Friedman looks at factors such as demographics and how they might unfold. What are the potential consequences over the next three decades? There are some criticisms that you can duly state, for example the lack of focus on non-state actors, climate change and a single future perspective, but it does create some good discussion points. Well that wraps up the Democracy Transition and Geopolitical Risks Unit. Thank you for your time.